In understanding the revealed mind of God concerning the scheme of redemption, one of the things that stands out in the study of the scriptures is that Paul and the rest of the writers talked about Christ as the only mediator between God and man. And Jesus is described in different ways in the New Testament. But one of these ways is that, that he is described as the mediator, as a mediator. I cite 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5, where Paul said, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus. The question we raise, of course, in this study is, what does it mean to be a mediator? And thus, it's the purpose of this sermon to address what the Bible teaches concerning Christ being the only mediator between God and man. First of all, the word mediator means, according to Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words and other Greek works, a go-between and it's employed in two ways in the New Testament. First of all, 1 Timothy 2, 5, one who mediates between two parties to produce peace between them. And in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it's Paul who says those parties are God and men. Then it is one who acts as a guarantee to secure something that otherwise is not to be obtained. Now in this case, Jesus secured the terms of pardon revealed on the pages of the New Covenant. And thus the inspired writer to the Hebrews declared, for this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant. So that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the covenant, first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Hebrews 9 and verse 15. I would emphasize here that Paul emphasizes the man Jesus Christ as the one who's the mediator between the two parties, God and man. But notice the covenant that's involved. You cannot just say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus as the mediator and then exclude the teaching of the covenant and what it says man's responsibility to God is. With this description then in mind, Let's look at the Greek word mediato. So remember that a mediator brings two parties together for the purpose of making a covenant between them. Now this is what Christ has done for us. So the question is, what qualifies Jesus to be our mediator? Well, remember, the inspired apostle Paul said there is one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Which means Jesus is the only one who could fulfill this role. He was qualified because he shared the characteristics of both parties. Don't let that slip by. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is qualified to be the only mediator between God and man because he shares in the characteristics of both parties, God and men. First of all, look at the deity of Christ. And in our studies on Sunday afternoon when it comes to John, we've emphasized this. John began his gospel account with the following words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1 and verse 1. Verse 14 says, That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory the glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Now in his earthly ministry, Jesus indicated plainly that he was equal with the Father or the first person of the Godhead. He did this when he said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. 
The Jews correctly understood him to be making himself equal with God by calling God his own Father. John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. In fact, Jesus also said, I and the Father are one. John 10 and verse 30. Paul told the Colossians, the church in the city of Colossae, Christians, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in a bodily form, Colossians 2.9. Thereby then, he's clearly indicated that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He was deity, yet he was God in the flesh. Now that brings us then to the humanity of Jesus Christ. Paul emphasized this point. Again, we refer to it, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2.5, when he said the man, Christ Jesus. One of the points we make out of that is a side entrance. Once Christ became man, he forever remained man. He is glorified humanity now. And John says when he returns, we'll see him as he is, for we'll be like him. Thus, part of the hope of heaven, Romans 15, uh, uh, Romans 8, 24, is that we will be in a glorified body like Christ has right now in the resurrection. So while the Word was with God and was God, so John wrote in John 1, verse 1, Jesus also became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, verse 14. So he took on the form of a servant, a bondservant, a slave, and was made in the likeness of men and was found in fashion as a man, Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. So when we think of Christ on this earth, he is like you. He's like me. Because he lived as one of us, we can have great confidence in him as our high priest. Now, high priest makes offers, offerings to God on behalf of others. Well, Christ offered himself. His body was offered a sacrifice. His blood shed for the remission of our sins. The high priest took blood once a year, went into the Holy of Holies, and offered it on the mercy seat for the sins of himself and all the people under the law of Moses. But Christ entered in the actual holy place of heaven before the throne of God and offered his own blood. So we know with certainty that he can, if you please, sympathize with our weaknesses since he's been tempted in all points like as we are, Hebrews 4.15. I don't know how anybody living any time on this earth, doing God's will, having become a Christian, cannot rejoice in that great promise. To know that he ever liveth to do what he is and what the mediator does. Ever liveth to make intercession for us. Jesus was qualified to serve then as the mediator between God and men because he shared then the characteristics of deity and man. Now in our study, let's look a little further at um, what our Lord did in his work as a mediator. We need to remember the two ways in which the term mediator is used in the New Testament as we go into this phase of our study. One who mediates between two parties to produce peace between them. And one who acts as a guarantee to secure something that would otherwise not be obtained. So Jesus brought about peace between man and God through his sacrificial death on the cross. He had no sin, so he could offer himself on the cross for our sins. In doing the work of a mediator, the scripture says he gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6. The word ransom then describes, according to Thayer in his Greek English lexicon, what is given in exchange for another as the price of his redemption. Thus we have in Acts 20 and verse 28, that he purchased the church with his own blood. And we've often made the argument that the church is worth the purchase price. And to denigrate the church which he saw fit to purchase with his own blood is to do nothing less than denigrate and put down the value and the importance of the shed blood of Christ. Now this is what Jesus did when he died on the cross. The apostle Peter wrote these words to Christians. 
knowing that ye were redeemed with, not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. This was good to remind Christians of that, remembering most of the New Testament's written to Christians. We need to be reminded what Christ did for us. And by the way, we could never do it. It took one of the Godhead three <coughs> to do what he did. Paul explained that it was through Christ <coughs> that the Father would reconcile all things to himself, having made peace, there's the end result, through the blood of his cross. He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Colossians 1, 20 and 22. This always is interesting to me because the devil thought he was ridding himself of the seed of woman. And yet he was playing right into the hands of the great scheme of redemption to save those the devil seeks to destroy. So by our Lord's sacrifice on the cross, Jesus offered his body and shed his blood. And in so doing, here's where the doctrine of reconciliation comes in. He made reconciliation possible between God and man. Only a mediator can do that, and that man is Jesus Christ. So this sacrifice was part of his work as our mediator because it allowed the two parties to be brought back together. Now remember, we are the sinning party. All is sin and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We have become dead by our sins, Romans 6, 23. How is it that a righteous God, a God of justice, can be reconciled to people who actually deserve eternal punishment? Well, we're seeing it in Christ. And that's what is so amazing. And the more you study it, the more you're just, I guess you'd say, confounded as to the amazing mind of God. So in his death, Jesus did more than just bring peace. He also ratified the conditions of peace. That's the reason I said earlier, there's no use talking about Jesus Christ being the only mediator between God and man and then not pay attention to what the writer of Hebrews said about his death on the cross brought about that new covenant wherein are the terms of pardon set out. He ratified the conditions of peace in the New Testament or covenant of Christ. Here's what the Hebrews writer said. For well, this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance, Hebrews 9.15. Now, that means that the death of Jesus was essential. It was necessary for this. And here's why. Because a covenant is in force or valid only when men are dead. For it is not in force while the testator lives. Hebrews 9, 16 through 17. While you're alive, you're on this earth, you can manifest your will as to how you want whatever you have done. But when you're dead and gone, if there's no will, nobody knows how you would want it done. And that's a legal instrument whereby we can know what Christ wants done in the case of our salvation, how we're saved, when we're saved, and how we're to live as Christians. How do I know we're to be worshiping God as we worship Him? It's in the will of Christ. How do we know the plan of salvation? The Lord tells us in His will. So this new covenant was it acted upon better promises, the Hebrews writer said in chapter 8, verse 6. As we look forward to the reward of heaven. Now under the law of Moses, uh, they were looking for as a system of types and shadows of the land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey. But now under the new covenant of Christ, we look for, as Peter said, a new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's our goal. So what are the benefits of having Jesus as our mediator? Well, there are the two primary functions of a mediator. But there are also two primary benefits for those who will submit in obedience to the Lord's covenant. First of all, we have peace with God. 
I'm quite convinced after all these years of dealing with myself and submitting to the truth and preaching to others and working with members of the church and those outside the church and the ups and downs that go along with life in the flesh that a whole host of problems, if not all of them, that we have any involvement in, where we have any control over, are brought about because we will not follow the teachings of Christ. We're trying to devise some way to suit ourselves. And, of course, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We also know it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We must determine what we're to do, what we're to think, what we're to say of the revelation of the will of Christ in the mediator's last will and testament. Paul said that in Christ we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, Ephesians 1.7. Remember, sin and sin only can separate us from God, Isaiah 59, 2. The biggest problem we face is the sin problem. Jesus Christ solved the sin problem. And he made it possible for us to involve ourselves in that solution. The blood of Christ allows us then to be reconciled to him, Romans 5, 9 through 10. Now, since we have peace with God, we also have access as God's children, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, to the throne of His grace, of His favor, Hebrews 4 and verse 16. We have the expectation of eternal salvation in heaven, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6. I'm convinced that many times in our daily walk with life that we don't think about those favors bestowed upon only those who are faithful members of the church. People outside of Christ don't have it. Those who have renounced Christ having become Christian don't have it. But God favors His faithful children. Second, we have a covenant that's been guaranteed. Now, we, we know what to do to be right with God through the revealed gospel of Christ, which is His power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. And then in verse 17, Paul explained, For in it... The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just or righteous shall live by faith. So it's the gospel system, the New Testament system, that contains the wherewithal that man needs to know, believe, and obey to give us these guarantees. We probably ought to think more about that in the churches we're faithful. You're guaranteed eternal life. You're guaranteed to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It doesn't mean that we don't have to be vigilant, cautious, circumspect in our choices. It doesn't mean we stop confessing our sins and shortcomings. That's all a part of the scheme of redemption too. But it means that we know in Christ we're in the position to enjoy His favor as we strive to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness now that we're children of God. And all that involves as a child of God, a member of the church. The gospel shows us how to live by faith. If it doesn't show us how to live by faith, what does? Furthermore, we know that the terms of the gospel will not be changed. It'd be terrible to know that God says, Now right now, this is what you must believe and do in order to be saved. Tomorrow, well, who knows? That's the reason it's a bad thing to say at the judgment in view of John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same who judge him in the last day. And then sit here and say, well, what about this? Or what about that? It's the word that tells us what to do to be saved and that we're faithful that's going to judge us on the last day. Jesus is not going to change his words. The gospel will read on the day of judgment as it reads now. The church will have the same importance on the day of judgment as it does now. Life in the church will have the same importance as it does now and as it is taught in the New Testament because it is the standard. It's been given once for all, Jude 3, American Standard Version, 1901. Because this covenant is guaranteed, then we have the hope. And that's not a wish, brethren. We need to remind ourselves of that. Sometimes we do some wishful thinking about things. But we know it's never going to come to pass. Hope means what I have a right to expect and I earnestly, earnestly desire to receive it. That's the hope that saves us because it carries us and looks beyond the troubles and trials of this life in the flesh. 
and it sees the reward, and it makes heaven draw nearer to us than if we don't ever think about it. I suggest we need to do a lot of thinking about heaven and where we're going to go because as a child of God, this is just going to be a blink of light in eternity that is our life on earth and the flesh compared to our long home, which is heaven. But think of the person that's lost. The person never obeys the gospel. The person who becomes a child of God and then falls away and ceases to live according to the truth. That's still going to be that blink of light in eternity and then the long place for them is eternal damnation and devil's hell and the lake with burned with fire and brimstone which is second death there's there's the place two places one of two places eternal glory in heaven eternal misery in hell everybody that's ever lived with one of those places and if i understand much at all about the bible it says a whole lot fewer will be in heaven than there are going to be in hell that's a sad thing as the writer of Hebrew explained, it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we have a hope both sure and steadfast and steadfast, and one that enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. Hebrews 6, 18-20. Jesus is already where we're going to be. And He's going to come back, and in the resurrection, He'll take us where He is right now. The new covenant with His better promises, Hebrews 8, 6, has been given then. And we can trust those promises if we can trust anything at all. It all comes down to this. We have the expectation of eternal salvation. And there should be that earnest desire to possess it. Because of our Lord's work is our mediator. That should make what Paul said to Timothy even more outstanding. There's one mediator between God and man. The man Jesus Christ. He knows our every weakness. He knows our struggles. He knows our pain. He knows our anguish. He knows our loneliness. He knows all of those things that plague mankind. He knows what it's like to be tempted to get him to sin. But he didn't. And thus, he's our Savior. Jesus did what was necessary to create peace between man and God. And he has in his covenant the way back to God. And it's the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, of the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But then how do I know how that works except through his last will and testament? He also guaranteed the covenant with his better promises. We're so privileged under the new covenant to have what all of those worthies listed in Hebrews chapter 11, 11 never had. And yet they are selected as great faithful servants of God, never knowing what we've known, never knowing the gospel. Abraham never assembled with the saints as we do to worship God as we have this day. He never partook of the Lord's Supper. Never did he. He never prayed in the name of Christ. And yet he's held up as he was faithful under what God gave him to do. And he's the father of the faithful. He epitomized faithfulness. Then how much more so for us under the better covenant established upon better promises because we have the great high priest who is touched by infirmities. Knowing these things, I ask simply, what could hinder us from submitting in obedience to the terms of pardon set out in the covenant so that we too can partake of the promises contained in it that we've been studying about this morning? And there's so much more than just what we studied about. So when we are going to, in a moment, to engage in an act of worship that shows forth the Lord's death, it'll come again, the Lord's Supper. And think about what that did. Think about what Christ's death on the cross did as the one mediator between God and man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. If you need to obey the gospel, I urge you to do so this morning. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time because we simply do not know what comes in the next minute. As a child of God, if you need to confess sins or if you need prayers for strength, we offer this time for you to let the church know your situation, confess your sins, having repented of them, God will hear and forgive. And I'm glad to always end a sermon on the note that the invitation of salvation is offered through Christ. He wants us to be saved. It's up to us to do so. If you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.